Welcome to City of Hope. Slavery to Sonship continues every Sunday at 11 a.m. in the chapel. Hayesot means foundation in Hebrew. This course helps Christians apply the Bible by better understanding the Jewish context in which it was written. The Hayesot course starts on Tuesday, the 9th of May at 6 p.m. in the chapel. Don't miss our Ascension Day service on Thursday, the 18th of May at 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Join us for our Pentecost conference from the 21st to the 26th of May at 6 p.m. and our night of praise and power on the 26th of May. Let us give people hope with Operation Hope. You are welcome to donate blanket, beanies and any tin food. The outreach will take place on the 17th of June. If you would like to be kept updated with services and events, please contact 079-520-2088. Sit back and enjoy the service. And so last Sunday we looked at how our praises can unleash God's power in the midst of our battles. And we looked at the story of King Jehoshaphat. And what we want to do this morning is, is do part two. And so would, would you turn in your Bibles with me to Second Chronicles 20 and verse 2. And we just want to read a couple of verses here from the account of King Jehoshaphat uh, to, to understand how we can release the power of praises into our battles. It says there, then some came, verse 2, then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria. Now, I don't know about you, we've been trying to praise God, and we set our alarm clocks on every hour last Sunday, and we said every hour we're going to praise God. How many of you felt some resistance in praising God this week? It felt like all hell broke loose. Pastor Kittigan, ah, oh, you know what, on Monday I got notice from two of my tenants say they're vacating my properties, I need to get it. And that's a painful and a very costly experience in changing tenants. And then it came from this side and then it came from that angle. And, and here midweek, you're thinking, let me just give up this praise thing. It's, it's too tough, it's too hectic. Come on, wie van jylle wat dit gevoel hierdie week? You felt overwhelmed by the... And this is exactly what Jehoshaphat is, is feeling. A great multitude is coming against him. Five different armies is attacking him. The battle is coming to him from all angles. And Jehoshaphat feared. It's, it's a natural response. It's a human response to fear, to become anxious when the battle comes to you, right? I mean, how many of us feel anxious when it happens? We feel stressed out. And then our, our human response towards an attack, towards this onslaught is either we fight. I mean, who of you are fighters? You, 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 when, when something happens, you want to fight. Yes, finna gani fight. Liffy, you can want upstick. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> uh, I just I pull a leg. How many of you are fighters? Come on, just, just show me. Some of us are fighters. Some of us flee. It's a natural response. We, we just want to avoid the conflict quickly. Come on, where's the fleers? The fleas, the fleers, okay? And some of us freeze. We're like, just play dead. It's going to go away. Okay, where's the freezers? Now, what's the rest of you? <laughs> Dishonest. <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, our human response, Gary, is either we fight, we fight, or we flee. God is saying through the Holy Spirit and His Holy Word today, I want to give you a third option or fourth option. And that option is in the battle to praise me. I want you to praise. Do not fear. Listen, it says here, Jehoshaphat feared and he set himself to seek the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judea. So Judah gathered together and asked help from the Lord. And all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Verse 15. Now the Lord answers them. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed because of the great multitude. You may feel overwhelmed, God is saying, but do not fear. Do not fight. Do not flight. Do not fear. I'm giving you a fourth option. For the battle is not yours, but God's. You will not need to fight this battle, God is saying. Position yourself. And we're going to come back to that. Remember, position yourself. Can you say position yourself? Okay. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And then verse 18, Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord. 
worshipping the Lord. And then the Levites of the children of the Kuatites and of the children of the Kurahites stood up and praised the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. Now, I don't know about you, but this morning when the worship team kicked off here, it was loud and high. I could see a bombskok gekraut, and you just put this loud. And I sent somebody back and said, please just put this softer and put that softer. And the drums is... Come on, we want you to do it. It was a bit loud, right? It's not normally this loud. It was a bit loud, okay? Apologies for that. But these guys were praying God loud and high. And they were giving glory to God, Okay? And when Jehoshaphat consulted with the people, verse 21, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise in the beauty of holiness. And as they went out before the army, and they were saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. We're talking about unleashing the power of praise in the midst of the battle. And last Sunday we touched on three points that I just want to highlight, and then we're going to go to, to three new points but you see, in Scripture, in the NIV translation, if you look at the concordance, there's 374 verses about prayer. 300, how much? And 74. In the same translation, there's 375 verses about praise. One more. So they pretty much on par. Praise and prayer. And I believe God is saying, as we said last week, He's saying, maybe you have prayed about a thing, you have prayed about a thing, you have prayed about this thing. And God say, now it's time to praise about it. Yes. As God so beautifully illustrated, He said, it's like pray, prayer is the left hand of the boxer and praise is the right hand. And oftentimes we, we want to fight a battle, but we only use prayer. We, like, we think we're Muhammad Ali, but we're not. You know, you can't box like Muhammad with one hand. You need to have both hands in the fight. Prayer and praise. And prayer and praise. And prayer and praise. And God is saying, it's time to praise me in the midst of my battle. Or the midst of your battle. And yesterday as I was preparing and saying, Lord, what do you want to say to the church? The sermon is prepared, but what do you want to say? God began to show me a few people here. Maybe you identify with this. I saw a businessman. And this week you need to have month end and pay your staff. And you don't know where the money is coming from. And God is saying to you, don't fear. Begin to praise me in the battle. Because the battle is mine. I saw a person, I think it's a lady, it can be a gentleman as well, but there's marital problems, there's a broken marriage, and the spouse has walked out. And you're at wit's ends and you don't know what to do. And you're thinking, Lord, what's going to happen? And God is saying, don't fear. This is my battle. Just begin to praise me. Just begin to raise your voice and sing a hallelujah in the battle. I saw somebody getting a health diagnosis this week. I, I just saw somebody sitting in a doctor's room and the doctor giving a prognosis and a diagnosis. And it's almost like when they said that, your heart dropped in fear and anxiety. And God is saying, do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. This is not your battle. The battle is the Lord's. Just praise me in your battle. And then I saw somebody who's under onslaught at the work, at your place of work. I don't know what department or what company you're working for, but there's people who have set themselves on destroying you, on removing you, and they they um, accusing you falsely, and they raise their voice, they slandering you. And you're just overwhelmed by the onslaught, by the battle. And God is saying, begin to praise me in the midst of your battle. Because this battle is not yours. It's mine. I will vindicate you. I will protect you. I will fight for you. We want to pray for you at the end of the service. You see, last week, I made the statement. I said, prayer informs God of the size of my problem. Prayer informs God of the size of the battle, but it is praise that informs my battle of the size of my God. You know, we've got this saying, it's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog, right? I want to say it's the size of your God that's in the fight that's going to make the difference. And the more we praise, the bigger God becomes in our estimation in the fight. 
Last week, we briefly looked at three principles. Number one, prioritize praise in the battle. We see that King Jehoshaphat called all of Judah, all the families, all the parents, all the children, all the young ones. They all came and sought the Lord and, and praised God corporately. How many people, many people have forgotten about God, have forgotten about our corporate worship. Even through COVID this morning in the first service, I met a couple of people who for the first time in three and a half years returned to church. First time I met them, Pastor Andre. I said, well done for coming back. It's time to prioritize our corporate praises because our corporate praise and worship can achieve and win battles that we cannot do individually. Yes. And so let's prioritize that. Second thing we learn is base your praise on the promises of God. And there's wonderful promises in the word. And the third thing was praise give God the ownership of the battle. Okay, but are you ready for some three new points, some three new principles? You ready? Okay, here we go. In verse 12, Joseph had prayed. He says, Oh God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that's coming against us. Come on, who have you felt like that this week? I'm completely overwhelmed by the multitude of problems that comes my way. Listen to this. Oh, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. You see, praise turns our eyes away from the problem, away from the battle, away from the enemy, and to our God. Franjo, I've learned one thing. The more I focus on the enemy, the more I focus on what he's doing, the more I focus on the battle, the bigger the battle becomes, the bigger the problem becomes, the bigger the enemy in the fight becomes. But the more I focus on Jesus, in my estimation, he becomes bigger. God doesn't change in size. No, no, no. He's great. He's almighty. He's sovereign. But when I focus on Jesus, He becomes bigger in my battle. He becomes stronger in my estimation in the battle. You see, oftentimes we are the ones that limit Jesus. And praise turns our focus on Jesus. You see, some of us have a very small God. Some of us have a, have a very, very small God. We also worship Jesus, but our Jesus is very small. He's so small we can hang him around our necks, actually. But Jesus says, I want to become bigger in your life. I want to become bigger in your battle. So turn your focus on me and away from the battle. And only praise can do that. When the battle is raging, when the voices and the noises are screaming for your attention, sometimes we need to raise our own voice to shut up all these other voices, to silence these voices. You say, oh God, I'm going to exalt you in the midst of my battles so that you can become greater and my enemy can become smaller. I'm not sure what you're going through. But you know this prayer and this praise that Jehoshaphat and the children of Israel all corporately, they said, Lord, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Can we say that? Say, Lord, we do not know what to do. But our eyes are on you. Come on, say that again. Lord, we do not know what to do. But our eyes are on you. That's the most powerful prayer we can pray amidst the battle. God, I do not know what to do. But one thing I know is if I turn my eyes to you, things are going to change. Things are going to get better. You see, the same book of Chronicles in chapter 16 says, the eyes of the Lord, verse 9, the eyes of the Lord runs to and fro on the face of the earth, looking to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are wholly set on him. You see, guys, do you remember those old photocopy machines? Pastor Des, they ran in the office with a the light. They went like... Can you remember those? God's eyes is scanning the earth like that. He's scanning the earth, looking for a heart that is wholly set on Him so that He can show Himself strong in battle on your behalf. Be it a battle at your business, in your career, in your finances, on, on the medical front, in your marriage with one of your children, with an addiction. God is saying, I'm looking for a heart devoted to me because I want to fight your battle today. You see, praise turns our eyes upon Jesus. 
And it just makes him bigger and bigger. And our estimation in the battle, verse 20 of Chronicles 20, says, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God. Can you say, believe in the Lord your God? And you shall be established. Say this, believe in his prophets. And you shall prosper. Second thing I learned for this week is that praise wields the prophetic word to prosper me. It's a long statement, but praise wields. What is wield? For us, what Afrikaans is, it's wielding the sword, right? Paul teaches us in Ephesians 6 about the armor of God. He says, take up the full armor of God so that you may stand strong. He says, take up the helm of salvation. The helm of salvation protects my mind, right? Takes up the breastplate of righteousness. It protects my heart. Okay? Take up the shield of faith by which you can extinguish every fiery dart. It protects me against the onslaughts of the devil, right? Take up the belt of truth. The biscara may lend in Afrikaans, okay? And then take up the shoes. All of those weapons are for defense, to protect. And then God gives us through Paul, one weapon for offense. One weapon to attack. What is that? Take up the sword of the Spirit. Amplified says the sword which the Holy Spirit teaches you to wield. And that which is the Word of God. That Word, Word, is not the Logos, the written Word. It's the Rhema Word. What is a Rhema Word? Who can help me? Where's the Bible scholars, Pastor Rina? It is a specific word of God for a specific person in a specific situation in a specific time frame. It's like a prophetic word. A prophetic word is a rhema word. Or when you read your Bible and, and suddenly one verse jumps out, like, like this story about Jehoshaphat, this, this account of Jehoshaphat is a rhema word for city of hope right now. And God is saying, take up the rhema word that I've given you. Get, take up the prophetic word and you will prosper. In the midst of the battle, you will prosper. You see, it's the rhema word of God that leads to prosperity. And as I prepared yesterday, God gave me a vision that broke my heart. He said, most of my people's sword is the size of a toothpick. They don't carry the rhema word. They don't believe the prophetic promise. Of. Some of them don't even know what my prophetic word is over their life. The, the rhema word of God. And we're taking out our sword. And it's almost like Brakanyan. Can you remember Brakanyan? I know, we're dating ourselves. So, klein swaar, ki gaat die ding, wou, ja. Gaan in die manne vech, sam met Portos, Artos, en Aramis, okay? And some of us are like Brakanyan. We've got this diminutive sword. A toothpick of a sword. And the devil is laughing at us. And God is saying, Church, I want you to grow your sword. I want you to get my word, to get in the Bible, to get in my word until you get away my word. I need you when your sword is so big, when you pull it out, and then the devil must somehow run away 10 meters and go and stand a little bit further because he's scared of your sword. Come on, what is the word of God over your life? What is the prophetic promise of God over your life? And if you don't know, in the month of May, we're going to focus the whole month of May on the Holy Spirit. And we're going to trust God that, that we will get revelation of His rhema word, His prophetic promise over our lives. Because God doesn't want His children to walk around with a toothpick of a sword. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, is your sword a toothpick? Or is it the real sword? How big is your sword? Paul says this to, to young Timothy as he's a young pastor of a church in the city of Ephesus. He writes, he says, This I charge, or this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you wage a good warfare. And God is saying, I need you to upscale your sword. I need to upscale 
your prophetic promise that you're carrying. As a church, we've, we've got these wonderful promises that we received last year when Pastor Andres van Yerden was here. He, he prophesied. He said, government officials will begin to get saved in Kimberley and the Northern Cape through the work of this church and other churches, but specifically this church. He says, government officials will begin to get saved and begin to be discipled, and that's going to turn around our municipality, and that's going to turn around our, our province as well. Come on. Now, we drive past the portals and we want to fluke. And God is saying, don't curse your government. Begin to pray for them. Begin to pray because I've given you a prophetic word. I have given you a sword. Don't cuss at the portal. Begin to praise me and begin to warfare with the prophetic word I've given the church because you are the agents of change in the city. Amen. And we've received many other prophecies like our kids' church will be a key to unlock the city. Do you know, since we got that word, Michael, our children's church grew from 45 to 90 to 140. Last month, we ministered to 200 children in the scope of a month. 200 different children. You see, we're taking the prophecy. And what are we doing? Not fighting. We're taking the prophecy. And we're saying we're wielding the sword of the Spirit and we're waging a good warfare with the prophetic words. Believe in the prophets and you shall prosper. The third thing I learned from Jehoshaphat for this week is found in verse 18. Sorry, not in verse 18. In verse 22. He says, Now when they began to sing and to praise the Lord set an ambush against the people who had come against Judah. They were defeated, and they helped to destroy one another. The last point I want to leave with you is this, that praise, Ivan, confuses and conquers the devil or the enemy. Praise confuses and conquers the enemy. This is not the exception to the rule. Because when I look at the story of Gideon, the one who we thought was a coward, but God called a, a courageous man of courage out of him. You know what they did? God gave them, he said, a strategy. He said, take pic, pic, uh, pictures with a fire in it and break the pictures and take a bill like a trumpet and blow and praise me and shout the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. And when they started praising God, the Midianite army of 300,000 people started to self-destruct. They were thrown into confusion and they started fighting one another. It is not the exception. It is the rule that when God's people praise Him, that it confuses the devil and it conquers the devil. You see, he's, he's thinking, but I have thrown everything at him. I have thrown the kitchen sink at him. I have thrown the bathtub at him. I have thrown the kitchen table at him. And still she's praising God. And still he's praising God. What the heck is going on here? And it confuses your enemy and it puts your enemy into self-destruction mode. But God says, Gary to Joseph, he says, take up your position. Don't flee. Don't freeze. Don't fight the battle yourself. He says, what I need you to do is take your stand in the midst of the battle. Come on. Can I say, say, say together with me, say, take your stand. Amen. Now I need the men to talk here. Just not just the ladies can also, but the men, I can tell a word. Come on. Say, take your stand. Take your stand. Be men. Amen. Be strong. Take your position. You see, God is saying to us, take your position in the midst of your battle. Don't run away. Don't hide away. Don't freeze up. He says, you're not going to fight. Just watch the deliverance that I work for you. I will save you. I will deliver you. Yes, it's Uncle Bobby last Sunday when he walked in here. He was frail. He didn't know what was going on. I didn't even hear the full testimony. When I saw him this morning, I prayed for him last Sunday. And we praised God in the middle of the battle, right? This morning he came, net so groot smal. He said, Pastor, I moet jou vertel. Daar's a wonderwerk. Daar's a testimony. You see, God says, don't vacate your position of praise. I need somebody to praise me in the battle. I need somebody to praise me in the problem so that I begin to fight and show myself strong on your behalf. Don't vacate your position of praise. 
This is what we do. Francho, what I find we do, we vacate our position of praise. And then we get confused. And then we get conquered. Come on, be honest. Who of you vacated your position of praise this week? I put up my hand first. Yes, here, look. When the battle was raging, when the enemy, all hell and hell, white water broke loose, we vacated. We just took a step back from that place of praise. And the the bottom door. And then we get confused. And then we get conquered. And God is saying, oh, I'm giving you a second chance this week. I'm giving you another seven days. Seven days of praise. Seven days of praising me in the battle. Because I need you to take your position so that I can fight your battle for you. Because the victory is ours when indeed the battle is the Lord's. And Dr. Bob Mumford says this. He says, maturity is the ability to hold steady while God finishes His work. Maturity is the ability to hold steady while God works all things together for our good. Can I just change it a little bit in context of this? Maturity is holding steady your position of praise while God is fighting your battle for you. God is calling us to a new level of maturity He's saying, come on, take a step up. Keep your position of praise. Why? Because God doesn't want us only to survive the battle. He wants us to thrive in the battle. Listen to verse 25. Wow. When Jehoshaphat and his people came, that's after the battle, to take away the spoil. Can you say spoils of war? Okay, the spoils of war. They found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies and precious jewelry, which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. And they were busy three days gathering the spoils because there was so much. You see, we only want to survive the battle. We just want to survive month end. We just want to survive the health threat that we have. We just want to make it to the other side. I don't know why, but here was five kings, five enemies attacking Israel, attacking Jehoshaphat. And I don't know why they did it, because normally when you go and fight an enemy, you lose your valuables, you leave your valuables at home, you lock it up in your treasury, and you go to battle to get more valuables. But here five kings came, and they brought their precious metals, and they brought their valuables, and they brought their jewelries to the battle. And God is saying, I've got something in store for you. I am working all things together for your good. You just want to survive the battle. But my intent is that you will thrive and walk away with the spoils of war. And for three days they carried out the valuables. And not three days to sell it. Leave the rest. It's too much for us. The treasuries are full. The storehouses are full. There's too much for us. God is saying if you would retain your position of praise in the battle. I will confuse the enemy. I will conquer him. And I will send you home with the spoils of war. If God is speaking to you, if you're hearing a prophetic word from the Lord this morning, if you're hearing a rhema word that's for you right now in this season, I want you to be up on your feet right now and reaching out to God. He's saying, this is me, I'm in a battle, I need to praise God. I've been praying, Pastor, I've been praying, I've been, I've been praying for this medical issue, I've been praying for this financial strain, I've been praying for my mother-in-law. God says, start praising, start praising me. Amen. Wow. We're going to, before we pray for you, I want to give you the praise challenge. Okay, you can take a photo of this on the screens. Set your alarm clock on the hour. I've done it last night again because I took a step back during the week. I said, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull this thing through. Set it for every hour to go off, okay? And put there, praise Him in the battle. That's what I do. Praise Him. And then when, when, when it goes off, praise Jesus. If you're in the boardroom, do it quietly. If you have a client, do it quietly. Otherwise, do it loudly. But praise Jesus till He becomes bigger in your estimation in the battle. Number two. Raise your sword, your rhema word, from being a toothpick until it scares the devil. Amen. 
And number three, praise God for both the victory and the spoils of war that he's given you. Amen.